Hi, everyone. Um, we, it looks like we have 113 participants. Um, so I want to welcome everyone to this webinar on chaplain documentation, best practices, and emerging, emerging research. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by Transforming Chaplaincy, and it is part of the Chaplaincy Functions Research Network. Uh, which is, uh, these networks are sponsored by Transforming Chaplaincy in their ways for chaplains and other interested parties to connect with one another in uh, collaborations to actually do research together and to share about research. My name is Christina Shu. I am a chaplain at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And myself and my co-facilitator, Jeannie Worksaw, are the conveners of the Chaplaincy Functions Network. Our network is designed for people who are interested in research about broad areas of chaplaincy. So that includes documentation, but also staff support, spiritual assessment, um, kind of any broad function of being a chaplain that doesn't fit into uh, having a specific category like health or pediatric. So we had a lot of interest in documentation and this is our first webinar about it. So I'm really excited to see how popular the topic was and how many people are on this call. Um, if you have questions and comments, uh, you should be able to submit them through the chat function uh, on Zoom and we'll be able to, we have some time designated for questions in the middle of our webinar. So I encourage you to, as you think of questions, to just go ahead and submit them and we'll keep track of them. And this whole webinar is being recorded and will be put online for free along with a PowerPoint. So don't worry if you miss any part of it. I'd like to just go over our outline for today. We are going to have my co-convener, Jeannie Werpsaw, who's at Northwestern Memorial in Chicago, give a background and a summary about past research uh, related to documentation. And then Jeannie, Paul, and Katie will give an overview of their current research projects. These are all three chaplains who have done um, recent projects related to documentation. Paul Galshut is a chaplain at M Health Fairview connected to University of Minnesota. And Katie Reimer is a chaplain at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. So after they present, we'll have some time, as I said, for Q&A. And then we're hoping to talk about some future areas of research and future directions, sort of the gaps and things that we still don't know. Uh, Jeannie and I have discussed some potential next steps and we're hoping that some of the participants on those call, this call would actually like to take those next steps and join us in um, creating research projects and connecting to one another across institution. And there's also some specific follow up from this call. All right, so without further ado, we're going to get started. Hello everyone, I'm Jeannie Werpsa, and as Christina said, I'm the co-convener of this network and just thrilled to be here today. I'm going to start off by giving some background information on what we know at this point in terms of research on best practices in chaplain documentation. Next. Next slide, Christina. There we go. So we're not the only ones trying to think about the electronic medical record and how to best um, adapt it to the needs of our patient care. There's been a bunch of research done by other disciplines and everyone is struggling to balance the uh, use of the electronic me medical record for documenting things that must be documented for legal reasons, but also really trying to make it user friendly and continually adapting it with each new iteration of Epic or um, Cerner to the needs of the team for which one is working. Next slide. Um, continue, please. So uh, just let me give you recommendations from other disciplines to start. One of the things that people have talked about is that we really need to optimize the systems to facilitate longitudinal care delivery um, and patients that are managed over time. So inpatient, outpatient, somehow making that work. We're in danger of repeating history by overstructuring it and overloading it with extraneous detail and data. And we can talk some about that specific to chaplaincy documentation. Um, wherever possible, the recommendation is that we not require users to check a box 
for information that's already captured elsewhere. And that would go back and forth between narrative versus checkboxes. And then, Christina, can you click again? Um, we're asking that clinicians, again, really start to work to leverage the enormous capability of this technology, especially to capture um, data points for research for um, across uh, network research, but also without di diminishing or devaluing the importance of narrative entries. Next, please. So when we look specifically at what have done on documentation, I'm sorry to say, but the truth, it's rare limited. Um, we don't have a lot of evidence-based uh, research done for best practices. What we do know is that our professional organizations have made documentation of care one of our standards. I've listed here, uh, I think, what is the majority of other publications that are, are out currently. And in a second, I will tell you what those highlight. Christina, next slide, please. So what do these studies tell us? Um, first, they tell us that the expectations of we've gone from being a, a profession that does not document in the electronic rec medical record to one where it is expected. And I love David McCurdy's phrase in his conceptual piece on documentation, where he talks about us being part of the community of confidentiality. Documenting every visit, access to the EMR is almost universal. And the studies that have been done, again, on that attest to that further. Um, but there's lots of variance in how much we document the level of disclosure and how we document. Um, the studies actually, when compared with one another, show us that there's no standardized documentation of assessment to date. The link between assessment and intervention and plan of care is lacking. We use various language. So a study done um, by Lee, uh, Curlin, and Choi showed that their chaplains at Duke were using documentation of very vague language, what was called code language, uh, chaplain uh, presence, pastoral visit offered, whereas the study that we did, which I'll talk about momentarily, um, showed that there was very substantial documentation by our chaplains with specific interventions and assessments. So there's a lot of variation. And that we're also not using terms similarly um, among our profession or with one another. Um, habits, personal preference, level of experience and training makes a difference in what is documented. There's some um, research done by our colleagues Tataglia showing that actually doing some quality improvement research makes a, a quality improvement research and intervention makes a difference in the quality of documentation that is done. Um, and then again, the format for documentation varies among practitioners between templates, semi-structured, and narrative notes, usually a combination of some of those. Next slide, please. So let me tell you about the article that we published in the Journal of Healthcare Chaplaincy um, a while ago in 2016. I'm sure some of you have had a chance to read that. It was a single site study done at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Next slide, please. And we extracted data from one intensive care unit. Chaplains who were experienced were included. Their notes were included in this. We excluded those who were inexperienced and priests because we wanted to look again at what an experienced chaplain documentation looked like. Um, chaplains in this unit were fully integrated into the intensive care unit. We wound up having a huge number of free text notes to um, do analysis on over 400 free text notes for an 18 month period. And we did two kinds of analysis. One was a descriptive analysis. So what were the themes? What were the content themes? What were the kind of language used? And then we did what we called axial coding where we stepped back and we used the professional structure of assessment, intervention, and out to see the frequencies with which chaplains were actually using those in our, our data set. What you see in the table below, again, are the main domains as well as those process categories. And I'll talk about each of those separately um, as we move to the next slide. Next, please. So again, the first domain that we uncovered 
was that um, chaplains were obviously documenting about spiritual and religious care. And we've given you some samples here as we look specifically at the kind of documentation and how rather than the what, let me just point out that chaplains in this set at least were very authoritative when they connected their um, religious and spiritual care to a medical care plan for a particular patient. So although a patient is Muslim, the family does not identify rituals or care for the body at the time of death. They were also substantive and detailed documentation of spiritual concerns and resources. Next, please. In the domain of emotional resources and needs, again, the primary emotions that were documented are listed here, but of concern for us as we look at documentation, there was what we determined to be a colloquial use of terms versus some kind of clinical measurement definition, especially around things like hope. So as we know, there are scales that help assess for the Hope Earth Index, but the way in which chaplains used language was sometimes colloquial, was sometimes more formal, um, and really quite unclear what it was we were saying in many cases. Next slide, please. The category that surprised us where chaplains were documenting a lot was that of medical decision-making and communication about um, the care plan. Chaplains documented both with some incredible specificity and role clarity when they were talking about DNR status, about what they did with proxy decision makers, um, and they often quoted verbatim report of patients' wishes. Now, what purpose that serves um, and whether that's something to be recommended, again, is something we can talk about later. Next slide, please. What was um, quite apparent was that chaplains were documenting the patient story with some specificity and a lot of context, and that that was one of the main um, purposes that narrative documentation by chaplains was serving in the medical record. Culturally specific behaviors, relationships, roles in the community, and again, connecting the impact of this illness on who this person is and conveying that if our colleagues are reading our documentation to other members of the medical team. Next slide, please. In terms of the process categories of, of assessment, again, as I said, the, this data set of documentation by our chaplains um, was quite descriptive and substantive, yet there was still no standardized assessment model that was observable in the documentation. When we think about interventions, next slide, please. Um, we noted that chaplains were already using the verbs and the more normative language that was emerging within our profession. Chaplains affirmed patients' resources, normalized their response to illness, reassured them about the upcoming tests. And again, rather than using code language, um, they were using language that was accessible to our colleagues. Um, there was some attempt in this data set to link interventions and outcomes, but not a lot. Next slide, please. And then outcomes. Let me just step back and say chaplains at our institution were trained in a five-part model of reason for referral, assessment, intervention, outcome, and then plan of care. And so they had those categories already in their minds when they were documenting, even though that at the point in which we did this um, research study, that was a kind of initial stage of doing that quality intervention. Um, so patients, or excuse me, chaplains reported on outcomes in three different ways. Patient reported outcomes, the chaplain's observations or interpretation, and then what we called for want of a better word, process outcomes, since so much of our work is process-oriented rather than something concrete that we can measure. Next slide, please. So when we step back, um, and I give you these best practice recommendations, um, not entirely based upon the study we did, where our recommendations were more posed in the form of areas for future research and questions we might consider, but as I've been thinking about this over 
um, many years and presented this research and been engaged in dialogue with people. These are the recommendations that I take from the work that we have done. Um, structured data utilization, in other words, check boxes, should focus on actionable analytics, such as referral patterns and faith-specific resources. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. All to say check boxes with language that is not contextualized is not the most useful kind of data either for interprofessional communication, that is with our colleagues, or intraprofessional communication from one chaplain to another. Narrative is better suited, um, as we know from our narrative medicine colleagues, to a chaplain's um, form of documentation. We know that better medical outcomes um, happen when we attend to narratives. The chaplain's role in part is to preserve personhood versus the more case-focused lens that our medical colleagues bring, and therefore that drives their documentation. But we also know that long detailed stories, and especially some of us who tend to be more verbose, um, that kind of documentation, those kinds of narratives are not likely to be read. Using a structured narrative note um, is highly recommended, um, in part because our colleagues are used to structured notes, but also because then um, it is hoped that they would know where to look for what it is that we're doing and what to look for and have some sense of our process. So certainly documenting with bullet points using the five-part mo model, reason for referral, assessment, intervention, outcome, and plan is one way. The other suggested um, potential way to document would be to highlight topics or themes that are determined to be relevant to the care in the particular area where we're providing it. Um, and I'll show you what I mean by that with a couple examples in a moment. And then finally, avoiding code language and vague references such as pastoral presence, um, coming to some kind of consensus on terms using normative language, but normative language that is contextualized, that says something. Um, linking assessment, intervention, outcome, and plan, and finally, making recommendations that are useful to the care team. Our colleagues do that all the time. And when I've done that, either as a chaplain or an ethicist, and I see someone actually quote my recommendation, I feel like I wanna do a happy dance. Next slide, please. So here's epic drop bomb down boxes to represent check boxes. When this appears, it appears to me, and certainly when I read this, and some of my colleagues have told me, it doesn't really tell us very much. It tells us, again, some things, but is so nonspecific to the patient care that's been provided. Um, and most folks with all of these, again, assessment, these kind of categories listed, don't really read all of this. Doesn't tell them much. Next slide, please. The alternative, of course, is when our colleagues document, they have a structure to their note. It's predictable, right? This is a physician's note. You see at the top, you know where to find the impression and plan. And at the bottom, you know where to find um, next step, goals of care conversations. So finding, again, a structure that is somewhere in between checkboxes and just free-flowing narrative is our recommendation. Next slide, please. So here is an example of a narrative note using a five-part model, but that is just all glommed together on the page, right? Lengthy visit, this is how I got there, here's the assessment, here's what I'm gonna do. And then, in contrast to that, this would be one that actually had a template or a structure. Uh, next click, please, Christina. There you go. See how it stands more out and you can actually find the things that EPIC will populate from boxes. Here's the faith denomination, here's what the concerns are, but then we've got some substantial yet structured narrative note. Next slide, please. As I've been thinking more and more about this, this is where I am headed, which is, and especially for more experienced chaplains, being able to lift up the specific areas in which we identified concerns and address them. So under categories that our colleagues can look for, grief, goals of care, spiritual, religious needs, etc. 
Next slide, please. That's all I've got for you. So um, we can return to some of the questions I've raised later and we turn over to my colleague. Thank you, Jeannie. I appreciate what you offered. It makes me want to do that happy dance you were talking about. Hi, my name is Paul uh, Galshard, as Christina mentioned in the introduction. I am a Transforming Chaplaincy Research Fellow, and I get to work as a research staff chaplain with M Health Fairview up in Minnesota. I say up, just given I'm guessing that that's geographically for most of you who are tuning into this. So when I sat in my focus group class while I was getting my master's in public health, my class project was to come up with something, and this is what I came up with. It was to ask our non-chaplain palliative folks, and I forgot to mention, I was on a palliative care team for 10 years as the inpatient chaplain. What did our physician, advanced practice providers, clinical social work folks, what did they think of our notes, and what did they find helpful and missing from them? So we were able to get seven palliative care team uh, focus groups together for that purpose. Next slide, please. So Jeannie did a nice job of talking about some of these uh, gaps. I just only kept two quotes here. Um, if you go to the next quote, or the first quote, um, Christina. So if you've read Wend Wendy Cadge's ethnograph ethnographic uh, sociology text, um, Paging God, uh, one of the quotes that sort of stood out for me was that um, in the 18 or 19 um, chaplaincy care departments that she was with, that she summarized uh, our spiritual assessment um, this way. As a non-chaplain, as a sociologist, as a professor, that most of our chaplain progress notes are a version of, quote, I was here, end quote. Would you go to the next quote, please, Christina? And as uh, Jeannie had said, um, some work coming out of the folks down in Duke, this is you know the Lee Choi Curlin article, code language is emphasized here. But what I did like is that there was this sort of positive as well as, a, uh, I don't wanna say negative, but a, a realistic holding up the mirror. The positive part of it for me is, we like you chaplain people, and we believe that you make these spiritual connections, but we're not necessarily seeing that in your documentation. Next slide, please. So who does read our notes, um, especially for palliative care chaplains? Well, we hope um, these following folks that emerge on your screen, and this was the convenient sample that we came up with, and this is who showed up for us in our sample. It was the physicians, the advanced practice providers, the nurses, the social workers, and then um, we had a pediatric team that uh, was able to have two focus groups with, and so we had, for example, a child life family specialist that was represented in one of those. Next slide, please. So here's a, a sense of who this was. And as many of us know in any kind of research, there's no perfect research study yet. So this was in the upper Midwest, uh, where I'm from in an urban area. And uh, but we were pleased with what we um, received from that. So this wasn't in California where Christina is or in Chicago, um, or of course anywhere else with, beyond the United States. But we had 42 non-chaplain folks show up. Uh, we were very happy and the we, um, forgot to mention, is my research partner, Judy Conley, um, that we facilitated these groups with. And then we had this mean age of about 43. And then these are the people that, um, that showed up. Uh, most of the people were, were white, which is pretty reflective of um, the Minnesota population in general. 70% um, were female. And I, I paused here with physicians because when I um, came up with this project um, in my class, I, I remember the professor saying, I doubt you're gonna get physicians to show up because um, it usually takes a fair amount of money to do that. Well, the incentive for people to come to the focus groups was a $25 gift card and breakfast. And um, lucky for us, two out of the five people that showed up for our focus groups were physicians. Um, so we're so happy for all the voices that chimed in and the wisdom that was given in these focus groups. And we're especially glad for all people which is to say, I think in palliative care, for those of us who've worked in that realm, or when I say palliative care, I mean broadly hospice and palliative care, I think people do deeply want to care for the whole person, recognizing that we are the specialists in that area. And I, so I was hopeful that physicians would show up um, by, for example, along with advanced practice providers, 
and they did. So as you can see also, um, Christians represented the largest proportion of our sample, and, but there was, a, I think, a healthy group of people who identified no religious or spiritual affiliation. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah, thanks, Christina. Uh, if you hit the next one too, that'd be great for the seventh one. So, when Judy and I, uh, my research partner, did our coding, um, a couple of things I want to say. Uh, I'm going to report on uh, this slide and the next slide, answer our primary research question about what was helpful and missing from the um, Palliative Chaplain Spiritual Assessment Progress Notes. And similar to Jeannie, and I, I mentioned this to Jeannie shortly after we kind of came up with these um, themes after reading the paper that our, uh, our surprise in our research was far and away of the seven focus groups. Um, our participants said decision-making, decision-making, decision-making. It, it, the frequency, the passion with which people talked about it, and they, they, yeah, they wanted, especially related to how does this get sussed out as it relates to the religiosity or faith or spirituality of the um, people that we care for, and then also how would they define hope. To save on space, um, I didn't put this in here, but if I had to put bullet points under suffering and coping, which um, for anybody in chaplaincy, but especially in palliative care, these would not be surprising that these show up as core content themes for our notes, but they, um, what we also heard was suffering, especially with religion and spirituality, coping, especially as it relates to religion and spirituality. Um, and suffering, I want to say broadly, that's the term we use, I think, kind of in that broader sense. I think distress, struggle, um, all of those could be used as well. In, in, but that's the term that we came up um, for our, our theme. And then we clearly heard, uh, and, and it's in the heart of it all, is this sense of religion and spirituality, kind of where they're at in the spectrum, be descriptive about it, and then what's the magnitude or the importance of it for that person or their family members or their loved one's story. Uh, Jeannie uh, talked about this quite well. From the perspective of how does this person and or family members or decision makers, how do they understand this illness at this moment in time and projecting forward? And then they also wanted to have a sense of, uh, this stood out a little bit, that was their spiritual story, um, broadly speaking, faith, that kind of thing. And then uh, I think this should be um, a nice pat on the back for all of our CPP educators that uh, they want to know what do you sense about family dynamics, both from the perspective of like how, how would you fill out that genogram for support, and then also what are the, what are the dynamics. And then one of the other surprises was perception of emotion. Um, there was a clear sense of how can we communicate in our progress notes, a sense of um, like one of the phrases that we would hear a couple of times in our um, the transcripts was, I don't wanna walk into a landmine. So give me a sense of what I'm walking into. So next slide, please. So uh, we are all busy in the world of healthcare, uh, no matter where you are, um, hospice, long-term care, acute care settings, uh, people want to read the documentation and they want to read it fast, thus the Jimmy John's reference. So one of the things logistics, um, one of the uh, participants had said, I put the time that you spent with that family, because if you were there for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe an hour, you told me that you dug in there. So I want to know how long you were there and tell me why you were there. Um, go to the next, um, thank you. Another piece that stood out for us was uh, a desire for a synthesis, um, summary. Uh, the uh, participant quote that we had was, if you put a synthesis in there, you tell me that you've weighed out what could be in your note and you've put what's most important on top. And this is, by the way, what we clearly heard. The summary content was, had a top part and a bottom part. So that descriptive content could be, perhaps be, um, similar to what I saw with Jeannie's notes, could be something below. But on, on top was, if I can only read something really quick before I run into a care conference, I want this. Go to the next, um, and then we clearly heard um, in this desire to have things quick, can you give me a scale? And of course that has its own challenges, but of those scales that were desired, we heard one for perhaps uh, suffering and distress, and then one about decision-making, which makes me think of Tracy Balboni and team's uh, recent uh, research on um, scale that they had worked on. 
And then uh, Jeannie mentioned this recommendations to staff help help us with language. Um, so there were stories shared in the focus groups, things like uh, if I walk into this family meeting and I and I'm an atheist and I it's a deeply religious family, help me uh, in there so I don't look like I'm a bonehead. Um, I don't want to get fired from the situation. So give me a sense of how best to facilitate that, as well as practices. Uh, I think that one of the quotes was. You know, how do we help a, a bedside nurse that's going to be there at two in the morning um, with a patient who describes that positive religious coping is really important to them and what practice might be important for them? And of course, like every other team member in healthcare, what, what are these needs, goals of care, and what's, what's your action plan? Next slide, please. So that part of the research, both the descriptive content as well as the summary content, will be a chapter in a book that's coming out this spring. And I'm kind of excited about it. Uh, Simon Payne Keller and David uh, Noheld put this book together there um, out of Switzerland. And it, this truly is an international text. Uh, Brent Peary, um, I think he's in Texas, is going to be a part of this book too. But it's um, a lot of the authors that you perhaps have read over time and uh, would commend this to you. I get no royalties or anything from that. So, um, but uh, this topic is so important and it's gonna be fun to see how the rest of our colleagues uh, address it throughout the world. Next slide, please. So um, these are some overall takeaways, I think from us that we really appreciated that, that people showed up, that our um, team members on these paddle care teams were there. And we clearly heard that there's something unique that you, chaplains contribute in your notes and we want to read that. Another thing that kind of stood out was fascinating was that uh, they want to, uh, they want to palliative chaplain notes versus if you're at like in a large medical center, not that they didn't want to read your other chaplain notes, but they clearly preferred you, your voice, you're the person they hear it rounds. Um, that was distinctive. And then we heard these paradoxes that I think Jeannie echoed in hers. We want bullet points, but we also want paragraphs. We want templates, but not too many points. And we want enough content, but we don't want too much. So um, next slide, please. So the, the cool thing about um, uh, these focus groups was we, we asked some questions and we got more information that we could have ever needed. So uh, I had to ask uh, Wendy Cadge, what happens when you get too much qualitative data? And, her response was, if you are able to sense that it answers a research question, then, then, you, then you can move forward. So ours was um, functions and recommendations. So I'll start with the recommendations, echoing Jeannie, you used the template. Uh, there was the sense, um, I'm not a big fan of when chaplains say, I have no agenda. I know what they mean, but if you have a template, then your team members know, well, here's my, my agenda. Um, integrate your interpretive impressions. I think one of the Duke um, articles I had said something about use your kind of your interpretive authority. Um, this was a clear sense was please write something like my impressions about this and then you know continue. We heard ne not necessarily that people wanted to see what our specific interventions or outcomes were but how do we integrate them into our notes, um, differentiate from social work and child family life. One of the participants said you know, if it didn't say chaplain on the note, I wouldn't know that chaplain wrote the note. It was so broadly psychosocial. We heard things like, don't write those two-liner notes that just stated that you were there or that you prayed and you left. Um, there was a sense like you're, you're wasting my time and you're perhaps endangering that I'll ever read your notes. Um, and then again, similar to what Jeannie said, there was a sense, you know, describe that you were more than present or that you did your favorite word for uh, listening. Next slide, please. So um, what a note does or what it functions as, uh, a couple of these first two aren't gonna come as any surprises. You know, it communicates, um, it educates. It also scouts, um, similar to the desire for us to write a perception of emotion. This is uh, one of the functions that um, I think one person had said, you know, I read the chaplain's note at the end of the day. I saw that they helped quite a bit with decision-making and I had to make a decision whether I'm gonna go see that family the next day or, or that afternoon and because I read the chaplain's note it saved me from you know necessarily going in and having the family rehash all these sorts of issues so scouts and it clarifies it promotes continuity um, it helps establish that that sense of kind of who we are together as a team reinforces the general specialist uh, language that comes out of a national consensus project it generates conversations and rounds there clearly was a sense uh, one 
participant said, I can remember three occasions where when a chaplain told me a person was so valuable, but it wasn't appropriate to be put into a note. And then the one that really stood out for us was um, a quote in particular about this overall sense that a note can humanize, that a, I think the quote that we use is um, that a person had written, you know, if I read a note and I'm in a jaded, tough place, um, reading a chaplain note helps bring me to a point of compassion, not necessarily that I'm gonna treat the patient differently, but it helps me see the patient through different eyes. Next slide, please. So what does this mean for our future? Uh, I'd love to do the same kind of question with a hospice or outpatient palliative care team. What would it mean to do it specifically with peds? Um, inpatient nursing, our largest source of referrals for those of us who are, are in inpatient healthcare. And then also um, what, it, what would it look like to create a bunch of templates and test them out with the non-chaplain readers of our notes. Is that, that could be the end. Next slide, please. It is. So it's, uh, I'd love to introduce my colleague as well. Uh, Katie Reimer, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Um, so this is, it's really fun to see the synergy between all of our um, studies here and recommendations. With my colleagues, Laura Kelly um, and Lex Tertaglia, Paul himself and Kathleen Kelleher, um, I did a study a couple years ago in which we collected samples of what we called, um, we, we said to folks, it, different academic medical centers, send us your best, your best examples of chart notes in the palliative care population. Next slide, please, Christina. Um, and we collected them and did some analysis. We presented these findings uh, at the APC conference two summers ago. And just to demonstrate the variability that we found when we collected all these samples, we at the conference showed a video of a pastoral care chaplain's encounter and we asked all the participants who were in the room to write a chart note as they would if they had conducted this visit and um, in their medical center using the templates that they use or whatever they do to chart note. And as you can imagine, the variability was astounding, um, not only in the structure of the notes, but also troublingly in what they considered happened actually, um, which is a topic of another research project. But um, the variability is something that I think all of us today are talking about, we notice, and we're trying to kind of hone in on what are best practices. And that's what we did with this study as well. Next slide. So, um, as I said, we put a call out um, to academic medical centers, palliative care chaplains. We asked them to send us their best practice chart notes. Um, according to their own discretion. We uh, reached out to about 48 academic medical centers, and I think we got, I know we got, uh, 14 uh, medical centers responded and had a total of 28 samples to analyze, and these were from all over the U.S. So we looked at both the um, templates, looking at, you know, the, the chart notes that included the drop-down menus and also the narrative for similarities, differences, opportunities for improvement in the field. Uh, we did some content analysis using a grounded theory approach. And we weren't exactly looking at spiritual assessment models, but on how chaplains documented what happened in the visit. Next slide. Um, this slide indicates that while Several notes had headings and templates or the structure that Jean and Paul have been talking about. Um, a lot of the content in the notes that didn't include them covered the same information. Um, so you can see that most notes, 82%, 85% included a reason for referral. Almost everybody did some sort of an assessment. Um, there was a description of an intervention in almost all the notes. Um, and what we're lacking were outcomes and a specific plan of care. Next slide. Um, so 14 of the 28 submitted use a flow chart or the drop down menus like Epic. Only two of the samples submitted only use the drop down menu with check boxes without any free text. 11 of the samples use both, both flow chart and free text. And then the other 13 samples included templates and also free text um, 
relying on them mainly rather than uh, providing the predetermined options, if that makes some sense. Okay, next slide. Three of the submissions were from outpatient visits, 25 were from inpatient visits. Um, outpatient visits we noticed were different. They included some topics like access to transportation, community resources, um, patient reported pain assessment, living arrangements. So it was a bit of a more psychosocial intake in the content. And only four of the 28 samples submitted included discrete categories for discussion about goals of care. Um, and two of these occurred in the outpatient setting. So that was also noteworthy because these are palliative care chaplains and goals of care as a heading was present in only four of the 28 samples. Next. Um, what we found that was consistent in the narratives, um, people let us know why they were there, what was the source of referral. Um, people generally did a good assessment of the support systems, family, faith, community support, Lots of details about denomination, particular church, and involvement with clergy. Um, exploration of patients' values, facilitation of life review. Many notes included direct quotations from patients or family members, um, like patients presenting concern at the top of the note with a quotation. I remember one sample was um, My doctor told me today that I and ready for hospice, I had no idea I was that close, something like that, which of course distilled the essence of what that visit was about. Uh, most of the notes included some medical history or background, kind of clinical information about the patient, and then there was a, um, a listing of interventions offered by the chaplain. Next slide. Um, what was less consistent? ambiguous, unclear, or missing outcomes. Um, people didn't think, many people did not include an outcome, what was the result of the visit. Either, as Jeannie pointed out, the patient reported or a process outcome or the chaplain's interpretation of what happened, just nothing. Um, there, were, there was a lack of defined plan of care or follow-up interventions. Um, one thing we noticed and that raised a question for us is um, evaluative language, often very um, nice, pleasant man, lovely family, but we did wonder, um, is that appropriate? Is that helpful? And should it be in a medical record? Um, and then also this variability around the use of the first person in chart notes, um, which is a question I'd love to discuss with others of you. You know, do you use the I when you're charting. Should we? Um, what do we think about that? And then the other um, important takeaway, I think, was this noticing a difference between strength-based assessments and pathology-based pathology assessments. And what I mean by that is um, I live in Boston here. It's a very secular environment. And um, I find that many of the clinicians, the non-chaplain clinicians, have no idea of the wealth of spiritual resources that many of their patients walk around with. And knowing about it would help the clinicians uh, feel better about the care they're providing and inform them as to how that patient might actually be doing. So without pulling out those spiritual resources in the chart note and focusing only on spiritual distress, which is also really important, I do think we're missing an opportunity um, to educate non-chaplain clinicians about the inner resources of their patients. Next slide. So our recommendations are very similar to, um, to Jeannie's and Paul's, I think. Um, we really like Brent Peary's work language around interventions and outcomes and refer all of you to, to take a look at what that language is like. Um, I'm a big fan, as I said, of including spiritual resources and sources of strength in a chart note, if you identify them. Um, utilizing direct quotes from patients. I, you know, I'm curious, Jeannie, after seeing your template, what it would be like to have, um, you know, at the top of a note, patient's central concern, 
with a direct quote that just kind of distills what happened in the visit or what, what the patient presented with. Um, I find myself in my own practice sitting in front of a computer and trying to come up with the quote that I think best represents um, what I think is central is, is a wonderful opportunity for me to hone my assessment, if you know what I mean. Um, so direct quotes, if chosen well, I think are succinct, they are descriptive, and um, kind of pack a punch in just a few words. Um, plan of care, linking the plan of care, of course, to the assessment and outcome. A lot of plan of care, plans of care were like, will continue to follow. Um, after what needs to happen, where the patient is, you know, where's their, their kind of edge in the decision-making process or whatever, and the plan of care doesn't link to that at all, and we're suggesting that it should. Um, recommendation against evaluative descriptions of patients, um, just because if one person's pleasant and somebody doesn't have a descriptor, um, uh, question about the use of the first person at our medical center, we do not use the first person in our chart notes. It can be challenging when you're writing a good narrative about a patient to always say this chaplain or um, speak in the third person but uh, it seems to be the professional discourse. And then finally, in particular with um, palliative care notes, we think there should be a goals of care heading in the template as a reminder as much to ourselves that that's a part of our job, right? And that we should be thinking about that. If not engaging with it in every conversation, it should be in front of us as something that we want to share with the rest of the team. Uh, next. So the template that we um, suggested, you know, I would pay more attention here to the content than, um, I mean, I guess I, I was listening to Jeannie's presentation and thinking, I bet we could get these um, headings all into the five point um, template. But basically, I'm just going to 